my name is Catherine Farrand. Welcome to episode nine of Kinetic Blue. I've been so encouraged by so many of you and I'm really grateful for all the feedback we've received so far. Today's a really important episode because it became apparent to me that there are different ways to enter into prayer and they're like anything in this world are way more effective and powerful methods of prayer than others. And it's really important that we understand the power of prayer and we know how to pray. And so that's really what I want to explain to you today. I've had times in my life where I've been extremely prayerful. I've spoken in my testimony about how I grew up, about the supernatural experiences that I went through as a young child and how that has moved into my adult life, what the last year of my life has looked like and how so much has been revealed to me through my deliverance, through my baptism and um, as I've grown closer and closer in my walk with God. The impact that this journey has had on my family has been extremely powerful, really, really beautiful. I want to speak today about the power of prayer in groups, the power of prayer in a marriage, the power of prayer in a family. And I want to give you practical guidelines on how to pray based on what it tells us in the Bible. A lot of people have never picked up a Bible. I've been so encouraged. I said it last week by those of you that have written to me to say that you've dusted off an old Bible or maybe even that you're not Christian and you've just picked up a Bible to read it like a storybook. There are some beautiful stories in here, some fascinating ones, some supernatural ones, um, and um, all of them make a huge amount of sense and come with a huge amount of instruction. So I'm here to simplify it for you. I'm really grateful that you've joined and I'm going to, as usual, just open with a quick word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that we're here today. Please open the ears of everyone listening to this podcast to hear. Cover everyone in the blood of Jesus. We spoke last week about the power of using the blood of Jesus in prayer and why it is such an important cover. Um, if you haven't listened to that episode, please go back to understand why I'm praying that cover over our audience today. And I also would like to pray on the scripture of Matthew chapter 4, verses 4, which says, It is written that man shall not live on bread alone, but on the every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that's what we're here to do today. So thank you for gathering everyone. Thank you for bringing those that need to hear. And thank you for opening the ears of everyone. Guide me that I may speak in the way that is needed, most genuinely, most authentically, and to bring up the points that I feel are most important today in Jesus' mighty name. I say thank you and amen. So that scripture, how fascinating is that? That man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I want to open with that and talk a little bit about um, what that means. Well, that means that we need to be programming the word of God into our lives. We need to be able to understand, learn, read and um, decipher scripture. And we need to be able to use it. We need to be able to stand on the promises of the Bible when we pray. A lot of people have said to me they want to learn about biblical fasting. And um, in episode 13, I'm going to be chatting a little bit about biblical fasting. But just as an aside, the reason why biblical fasting is possible for extended periods of time, including up to 40 days. And I know a number of people that have fasted biblically on water alone, both day and night, um, um, for 40 days, is because of this exact chapter. They stand on the fact that man shall not live on bread alone, but on the word every every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And that means that if you are reading the scriptures during your fast, if you are praying, if you are leaning in because someone is ill or someone is dying or there's something that really has to be moved in your family, um, there is a, 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 a like demonic work at play in your family. And people have really reached out to me. People are so aware. Children are so aware of things that are not quite right in a family. And it says in the Bible that those types, some of those types where there's demonic oppression from bloodline to bloodline or within a family or you're noticing something a little bit strange, those types will not come out except by prayer and fasting. So whatever it is that you're fasting to move in your life, if you are not reading the word of God and immersing yourself in scripture and in prayer during that fast, you will struggle, you will feel starving, you'll feel distracted, you will want to break your fast at all points of time. Um, my, my biggest fast I've done is a four day water fast and I spoke about it a little bit before, it was because of the word of God that I never once felt hungry, never once felt swayed, never once felt interested, making roast chicken, making ribs, making legs of lamb for my sons as I normally do. I love to cook and uh, organic and healthy food is a huge part of my life. If you know me through us organic, not once was I tempted to eat. And that brings me on to how do we know that we need to pray using the word of God? For those of you that understand, um, there was a time before Jesus started his ministry on earth where he went out into the wilderness, into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and never ate. He fasted. 
And during that time, Satan appeared to him and tried to tempt him with all sorts of things. And it really is quite a funny story. I've spoken about it a number of times before when my boys and I laugh because Satan stands on a hill with Jesus and goes, do you see all of this, all of this, the whole earth, the sky, everything in the heavens, everything in the seas, everything in the land, this could all be yours if you just bow down right now and worship me. Um, and Jesus kind of <laughs> looks at Satan and is like, first of all, that is all mine already. I am the son of God. But every single answer that he replies um, back to the temptation of the devil is starts with the words, it is written. And never once is the devil successful in any temptation he puts across to Jesus. Like, if you are the son of God, take this rock and make it into bread. And Jesus responds, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone but by every mouth word that comes out of the mouth of God. So I don't need that bread. And by the way, you know, funny side of things might be like, if I'm the son of God, do you think I'm going to turn bread into a rock into bread? You know, there's other things I'd want to eat. But the point is that it is written is always his answer. So I want you to remember that, that if you are praying for something in your life that you really desperately want to move, and so many of you have reached out to me, you know, you've, you've looked at all aspects of life, you've looked at all elements of life and things aren't breaking. There's disease, there's sickness, there's behaviors, there's addictions, there's um, infertility, there's uh, miscarriage, there's barrenness, there's difficulties in a family. And often those things will be broken. Not often, most times those things, depending on the faith of the person coming to God, will be broken through prayer. And it is always best to start with, it is written. And that's what I'm going to teach you a little bit about today. Why do we pray? Again, people are still kind of gathering onto the, the fact of like, why would I pray when I meditate every day? I do breath work. I do um, gong baths. I do all of these things. And I connect in my own way to source that kind of through those things. Well, that was me a good four years ago. I've spoken deeply in my testimony episodes four and five as to why there is absolutely no power, unfortunately, in those modalities of healing. Yes, they bring you a little bit of calm and yes, they might clear and open up your mind, but they also can open up channels to things that you don't want to get involved in, which I saw myself involved in. And also without the cover of scripture and without a direct relationship with God, there really is absolutely no power in moving any needle supernaturally or otherwise, unless there is prayer. In um, Isaiah chapter 54, verses 17, and I'm trying to learn scripture now without kind of referencing, I'm trying to learn it off by heart, but it says in that scripture that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It is something we pray every single night, my children, myself, and my husband and I, because we know based on what we've been through since our family has turned and come back to the one true living God and turned away from things that didn't feel right, even sort of religious behaviors that didn't feel right, because you know, I've speak, spoken about a little bit before. Sometimes a lot of deception and lies are wrapped up in a religious packaging. It looks really pretty. It looks really beautiful. But on the inside, there's no deep connection, no relationship with God. And that is just null and void in, in, in the eyes of God. You can be religious as you like. Um, I spoke about it a little bit before. It is the Pharisees and the most religious people that ended up crucifying Jesus. So just praying to God to say, let me know whether these things in my life where I'm leaning on the wrong ways and teach me how to pray. Teach me through this podcast. Teach me through your own connection with God in the secret place. It's talked about in the Bible that the best thing that you can do if you're struggling or trying to understand God or trying to understand how your life is working is just to pray to God. Show me the way in which you'd need me to pray. Show me the things in my life that I'm doing that are right. Show me the things in my life that I'm doing that are wrong. And I was extremely shocked when my eyes were opened as to what was going on in my life that wasn't quite right. I attended a number of breathwork sessions, a number of gong baths, and my mom was actually talking about it now when I was back in South Africa. Um, you know, there was a gong bath uh, every week in our neighborhood in London, and I always had extremely bizarre experiences. And a lot of people came to me and said that they were quite nervous in the gong baths. I was like, oh, don't be ridiculous. You know, sometimes when you're opening up and you're channeling and all that, it can feel a little bit scary. No, it should never feel scary. But a lot of the kind of... Um, eeriness in the air is obviously because when you're opening up channels without the cover of God, there is demonic activity at play. It speaks about in the Bible um, over and over again about open doors. If we open a door in our life, true is Bob, the devil is going to walk through. And there's a beautiful scripture, which I just pulled up in the car um, uh, earlier before we came. And I think it's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, but it says the devil roams the earth looking for what to devour. That's what he spends his time doing any open door and you can be sure he is going to walk through and you might not understand what that means right now but just bear with me when I tell you that when you are in healing modalities whereby you don't understand what you're opening yourself up to you're opening a door you're legally paying someone 
to, to go to a gong bath, you're exchanging information with someone who's going to do some type of healing over you or your child. That is an open door because effectively you're entering into an agreement with that person. And it says in the Bible, two cannot do anything without being in agreement. You can't even have a coffee with your friend at a certain time and a date without being in an agreement. It's a form of a covenant. So when you exchange money and you exchange energy with someone who's going to perform some healing over your life, you are opening a door unless you believe that person is Christian. And in many times, oddly, religious performances of healing um, can also be something we need to watch. Um, and I've seen that before. And you'll hear people saying this happened to me at the church and that happened to me at the church. And it wasn't actually what I thought it was supposed to be. So that is why really I'm here to tell you today that the number one person you can trust is God. God can deliver you. God can heal you. God can guide you. And you yourself, once filled with that Holy Spirit, and I spoke in my salvation episode, which I believe was episode six, um, as to how you, you 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 get filled with the Holy Spirit and you start to talk directly to God and he will guide you to the people in your life that you need. But you shouldn't have to be paying anyone ever to receive any kind of prayer or you shouldn't be being paying for anointing or paying for access to God. It is 100% free. You are free once you believe in Jesus. You are free to discover the word of God and to grow deep in that word and God actually says um, and it's the most beautiful scripture in Jeremiah 33 verse 3 call to me and I'll answer you and I will tell you great things that you have not known how beautiful is that that's exactly what happened to me after trying everything I found myself in these gong baths I found myself in this breath work workshop which was held ironically enough and blasphemy ish blasphemously whatever the word is enough in a church in London and it was in a beautiful church and I remember thinking oh wow I'm going to be so close to God and at all this time I, I, I've said it to a number of people that have reached out to me why did you turn from God why would you turn from God well, if God is so good why would you turn from him I never turned from him I forgot to read the Bible I lost sight of things and I got tempted to the glory and the beauty of all these healing modalities that don't have God in them and give access to demonic activity in your life and it looked so beautiful and it felt so powerful but in this particular church on this Saturday morning, I had three people have to come and hold me down because of what had happened to my body at that time. I was lying next to the mother of a friend. And actually, I should talk to her about it because I'm in contact with her. I know she watches the podcast and she's a mom of two beautiful boys. And I'll have a word with her because her mom was lying next to me. And um, I went into like uh, fits and shakes and could not be controlled for probably about 45 minutes. So these supernatural experiences have happened to me a lot in my life. In this particular um, experience, what had happened was I had traveled forward in time and people are like, I never told anyone this except my husband because people, who's gonna believe me that I went to the future? No one. Um, it is extremely possible uh, through spirits of divination and, and demons that work in time travel to travel both back and forth. Um, and when you travel into the future, you can see anything that you need to see. And we know this is possible because God himself writes, I knew you before you were knitted in your mother's womb. You were made fearfully and you were made beautifully. And God knows the destiny of every single one of us. He understands what it is that you're meant to do, which is why in the episode about work, I spoke about how important it is that the work that you're doing is to the glory of God, that you feel called to the work that you're doing, that you feel empowered, that you feel like you're giving value to God through the work that you're doing by encouraging people to do what is what they're meant to do, by supporting people, by supporting yourself however that might look and so when I traveled forward in time you can't imagine I've spoken to you a little bit about the soul travel where the soul leaves the body and you can move to different parts of of um, different realms so you can deal with underworld spirits you can um, move into the heavens and I've spoken to you about my experience in the heavens in the three heavens um, and and I haven't gone into detail about that experience because I'm, I'm not quite ready and that was a beautiful experience and that was under the cover of God and that is a gift from God, one of the gifts of God that, that some, a lot of people, many people have. But the other times I traveled without the cover of God was very, very scary, extremely taxing on the body and puts the body into a state of shock. Because when you move forward in time, time is really not really a, a thing. You know, God said I, he created um, everything in, in the six days of creation and on the seventh day he rested. You can read it in the book of Genesis. My sons and I have been reading it over and over again to understand that with every word he spoke, so he created. How beautiful is that? And that is why the words of God are so powerful. But really, when you move forward in time, uh, you my body went into a state of shock. And again, I've written down everything that I saw and it was 
amazing and truthful because when you see people with these spirits of divination in the Bible, there was a woman specific, specifically that's spoken about that comes up to Jesus' uh, apostles and says, these are true men of God. These are true men of God. These are true men of God, shouting and screaming out. And no one else would be able to know who's a true man of God and who's not. But that spirit of divination cannot cannot lie. And so the things that you see are extremely truthful, but it is not for us to know. It goes back to that story of Adam and Eve. God says, do not eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge, uh, uh, the, not, the, not, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because that is for me to worry about. You have to let my will be done. That's what we say in the Lord's Prayer. Let thy will be done on earth as it is here in heaven. That kind of access is not meant for us because we need to trust in our creator and we need to trust in God and we need to be prayerful of in everything in our life. Um, and so that's when my body went into the state of shock. And it took me a long time to recover from that. But again, when you're in that space, all you do is think how powerful you are and how gifted you are and how close to source you are and all of these kind of things. And I saw things there that I, I should not be privy to. Um, and so I just want you to understand, I've got a lot of you reaching out saying, but I meditate every day and I do this and I do that and I do the next thing. If you're doing those things to lower your cortisol levels and to balance out stress in your life, that's fine. But if you are finding yourself having access to more power, information, and feeling like there is a sense of travel or communication with spirits or that you feel your body can be like a channel in these instances, I would advise you pray and ask God whether that's something you should continue with. So prayer to move our lives forward is absolutely everything. And how do we do it? Now, there's no weapon formed against us scripture that I was just talking about. It actually tells us that each and every single day, going back to the scripture of, of the devil and Peter roaming the earth and looking for what to devour, we have to understand that in every point of our lives, there is always an, a negative influence looking for an opportunity to infiltrate. Now, most people would say, oh, you're fear mongering or you're just trying to scare people into this, that and the next thing. That is just the way it is. We want the knowledge of good and evil. We need to have the knowledge of good and evil. It says in the Bible that my people shall perish from lack of knowledge. My people shall perish from lack of knowledge. And that is really a part of my conviction is to help people to understand and explain why it is that you feel God doesn't hear you. Why does you feel that your prayers aren't working? Or why it is that you find yourself so far removed from God and potentially and hopefully I pray that maybe something I say in this podcast helps you to move to more prayerful life or to maybe understand more of what I'm teaching so that you don't perish through lack of knowledge. So I wanted to bring up that Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against us shall prosper so that we understand we need to program our life based on the word of God. Now people are like, oh, well, that's so difficult. How long do I have to take to read the Bible? And I don't understand it and I don't have time. But you know, in this day and age, you can find yourself caught in a social media loop based on the algorithms that pull us all in um, and 20 minutes has gone by, you could have spent those 20 minutes with your eyes closed on your phone on airplane mode, just seeking God and, and knocking and asking, where are you? Um, or walking down the street and looking at the trees, um, looking around you and just saying, you know, God, if you're there, show me a sign, reach out to me, show me the, which way to go. Starting to formulate that relationship with God. He wants a deep and meaningful relationship with each and every single one of us. And when you read scriptures like the fact that weapons are being formed against us at every turn and if spiritual warfare is something that interests you or you feel like your life is under attack like things are always going wrong you know when you have that feeling like oh, just one thing after another and then this and then this and then this and then this likely there's something spiritual at play in your life and I haven't talked yet about altars um, and covenants and how those kind of things work but I have spoken a little bit about generational curses and it is important that we understand that everything first manifests in the spiritual and then happens in the physical. So for people that don't believe in anything outside of these four walls, you know, a lot of stuff in life would be very difficult to try and explain. Um, so so let's begin. What is, what is the point of programming your life? Because everything about your life will change when you bring the promises of God into your life and you stand on them when you're asking for help. You're asking for help for a job. You're asking for help to seek someone that you want to marry or that is right for you to marry. You're asking for help when your children are unwell or there is an illness that is completely completely not understandable by doctors or anyone around you. You're asking for help when you need to understand your the behavior of your children or the night times or the things that are making you afraid at night or the things that your mom and dad are talking about that you do or don't understand. That is what I mean by programming your life. 
the first ever version of us being taught how to pray was the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the first thing God loves from us is for us to say, thank you, God. You are glorious. You are mighty. And you are the creator of all things. Hallowed be thy name. You know, glorified, honored. Hosanna in the highest. Hallelujah. All those beautiful words that just give praise and glory to God. Thy kingdom come is another beautiful one, which means that it is written in the Bible. I've spoken a lot about the book of Revelation, that the kingdom of God will come back. Back in the day, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and, earth, uh, Adam and Eve roamed the earth before they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that God dwelled amongst with us. He lived there. He walked in the garden. He called out, Adam, Eve, where are you? And by that time, he called out to them after he'd created Eve using one of Adam's ribs, a rib out of Adam. He used his own godly anesthesia. Talks about it in Genesis. He put Adam into a deep sleep and created the first surgery ever to create woman from the rib of man. Um, and that is why the healing of God and, this, and, the, and the power of God in, in, in healing us and knowing what to do with our bodies. He's the first greatest ever physician and doctor, in my opinion. Happened there and then in the Garden of Eden. But God used to work with, walk with us and he will dwell again with us. It says that in the Bible. Jesus will come back down through the clouds. If this is completely over your head, read the book of Revelation and understand what will happen um, in time in, in, when Jesus returns and everyone sits at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, whether you want to learn more about that or not, please reach out to me. But um, the, the, that's what the Lord's Prayer means by thy kingdom come. We wait for your kingdom to come back down on earth. Because at the moment, and I actually preached about it in church the other day, and I was blown away because sometimes in church they don't really speak about stuff that can seem quite scary or that isn't kind of sugar-coated or, or gentle, you know. But um, the prince of the power of the air is uh, the words that are used in the Bible to describe Satan, the prince of the power of the air. He roams, he's not yet um, um, judged, which means he's not yet locked down in the lake of fire in hell. He's around, he's roaming the earth, as I said, looking for what to devour. But it says here, the prince of the power of the air um, is the ruler of this world. I really wanted to make a note of that, and I think I did. Um, where did I put it? Um, I think it's 1 John five nineteen. We know that... Um, I can't quite pull that up, but there's a scripture and it is, yeah, it's 1 John 5, 19. The prince of the power of the air is the ruler of this world. You can read it for we know that the king of the God of this world is not God. Otherwise, the world would not look how it does. Our t television would not be infiltrated with signs and symbols. There would not be evil lyrics in our music. You know, someone pointed out the other day about Taylor Swift's new album. Most of her words are explicit and slanderous and blasphemous to the Bible. Like if you can sing about anything on earth, why would you be blaspheming stories in the Bible? So be careful about lyrics and things that you're letting, songs that you're letting your children listen to over and over and over again. A song is a version of an incantation. When we sow a song into our spirit, it's, um, it's exactly what we're trying to do with the word of God. Sow it into the spirit of ourselves so that when we speak, we use the power. We stand on the power of the word of God. The same thing goes for the lyrics of some songs. I'm the kind of person that since I was about five years old, I know the words to nearly every single song there is to know. Not so much modern music, but at least stuff I grew up with. And um, once you know the lyrics to a song and you get a feeling and an understanding, you can kind of ask yourself, why are there songs like called Sympathy for the Devil and um, Black Magic Woman and... You know, it, once you start to listen to lyrics, you actually can have a strong understanding of where those songs are gaining their power from. And when you read in the Bible that the devil, that Satan is the king of the ruler of this world at the time, that is why we put into our prayer, thy kingdom come. We wait for the day that evil is obliterated off the face of the earth and we live again in harmony and God dwells again with us. And that is the whole point of life, to glorify and honor God and get to know him more and more and more and more and more until that point so that we cannot be temptate, tempted and we can stand on the word of God and answer every temptation in our life with it is written. Now that might seem completely impossible to do at this moment in time. And so maybe the best place to start is just with a small prayer today. Um, as we move through thy kingdom come, thy will be done, which is just what we want. Thy will be done. Thy will, which means the will of God be done in our lives. Not the will of Catherine, who is spiritually high after three hours of a breathwork session in a church in the middle of... Um, I think we were in Notting Hill. I keep talking about Notting Hill. It's like, were we in Notting Hill or like the back of Notting Hill or something? But but thy will be done, not the will of Catherine floating, levitating, having to be held down by three people and seeing forward into the future and then coming out and speaking with a spirit of divination to everyone what's going to happen in the future. I didn't do that because I was 
I was scared. I was very, very scared. And I was scared that my body would not recover as well. And once you open yourself up to those types of experiences, thinking that I can heal myself, I can pray for myself, I can see the future, I can travel, I know everything, it happens to you more often than not. My husband had to come and rescue me out of a Russian bunya. He actually never came, but I made it home in the end. But in the end, he was like, you should have called me. But every single time I entered into any, I got enough into a trance state, that would happen to me. And this time, luckily, I had paid for a private package at a Russian bunya here in Dubai. And I had a woman watching me. And the minute that I'd done 45 minutes in the banya and they whip you with these birch leaves, it's actually a really beautiful detoxification process. It's not supposed to be overly spiritual. But what I'm telling you is when you train your spirit man in the wrong way, every time there was an opportunity for demonic activity or for me to open up as a channel, I would. So I would go into a massage and my eyes would roll back and my head would rock and I would know, okay, I'm in that trance set. I've got to bring myself back out. But in this instance, it was 45 minutes. They hit you with these birch leaves. It's a Russian tradition and it's, I love it. I would do it again and again and again, but without allowing myself these trance states and, and with the cover of God, because that's where I was at. I'm not saying anyone that goes to a sauna is going to end up like that. But the whole process is very beautiful and very intoxicating um, and detoxifying. Um, but after that, I had to get into an ice bath and I I basically, my spirit left my body. So the body sat in the ice bath. I think I was in there for three and a half, coming up to four minutes after 45 minutes of heat and being hit with birch leaves. And when you're hit with birch leaves, it creates a steam on your body. You kind of, they push the steam down on the body. They don't hit you. And the steam presses and helps the body to detoxify. So it was a very open channel. And basically, I had a very dangerous emergency experience. And again, they had to pull the red cord and there's three people trying to bring me right. And I went into hypothermia and eventually ended up back in the bunya where they could warm me up. And the point is that every time this happened, I kind of thought, I don't know what I thought, but I was gaining more power. I was gaining more access to seeing and knowing things, but I wasn't understanding the danger of it all. And when I retold the story, I was always like, oh, I was probably in the ice bath too long. Oh, it's probably, you know overdid it because as I said in my opening testimony if there was yoga I was standing on my head bending myself backwards and channeling spirits if there was this I was doing the extreme of it if there was that I was going to do the best of it you know and that was very much my way um, and I know there's a lot of people that know me that are probably like now Catherine's van God and she's moved it to the very very end needle but this is what I've been looking for my whole life the only thing that has ever made sense of every single thing that I've been going through and not all of us are searchers or seekers and um, if you're not like me in that regard then I would hope that you just pick up a couple of words and go forward where you need to go so let thy will be done is very important we need to understand that every time we pray we don't say God I want a Lamborghini I want my businesses to fly I want my children to be successful I want my marriage to be a beacon of hope for everyone in the community no 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 because that is resting on your own will it is about surrender and it is about understanding that no one knows what is meant for your life more than God and he really does push us to lean into his will being done. That is why it says, let thy will be done in the Lord's Prayer. So the Lord's Prayer gives us a really powerful structure for how to pray. Lead us not into temptation. God knows full well that evil is on the prowl, that the devil roams the earth looking for whom to devour. And for anyone that has an addiction to food, alcohol, drugs, that has certain behaviors in their lives that they don't know how to change, that are addicted to pornography or masturbation or certain things that are going on in this world it's very difficult to stop because that power of temptation a is disgu disguised as, as something beautiful and harmless oh who's going to care if you have a couple of drinks come on you've had a hard week it's fine go on you know it's exactly what the children see in the cartoons the little voice of of the devil and the little voice of the angel so lead us not into temptation is a really powerful part of prayer because we need god's power to be strong, to program the word of God into us so that we, like Jesus in that time in the wilderness, can answer temptation in our lives with it is written, it is written, it is written. And that's why anytime people reach out to me, my child's ill, I don't know what to do. I've had, I mean, it's very interesting to me that I've had about 12 people out of the probably 100 that have come to me, which has been so moving, all from a place of encouragement or from a place of questioning. But 12 of those people have had satanism in the bloodline within one generation back and many times a lot of these people have said to me my mom's nuts my she said my grandparents were doing this she prays about the blood of jesus she's trying to get me to read the bible and understand scripture i think she's completely too much overboard i'm just going to live my life and then have been able to hear what i'm saying and understand why there is that pleading of the blood of jesus over the lives of people that have satanic 
uh, uh, covenants at work in their families. It's very powerful and it's extremely, extremely real. And I was saying to someone this morning, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. I'm not here to prove that to you. I'm here to tell you that no matter what you believe or know, that is what is happening. It's kind of like if we all both watch a movie on Netflix, we both know that movie's on Netflix um, and we've watched it. Like it's, it, uh, that is how I've seen this and I've and I've spoken to people that have seen it and I've met people that have, as, as I said, I leaned deeply into a group and, and trying to find people that could validate what I'm saying. You know, I spoke about my mother's brother's son who was so able to validate what I was saying and he himself was down on his knees in prayer for me during my very difficult times without me even knowing. So we really do want, you know, the will of God to be done. We want not to be tempted. And it's very, very difficult in this day and age. I haven't yet got into the insides of um, the insights of how the world works and how we are pulled at every turn away from God. Um, but let's let's move on with prayer. So um, deliver us from evil comes after lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. We've said this each and every single day for those of you that went to Christian schools. That is exactly what the Lord's prayer says, deliver us from evil. Well, that doesn't mean that there's not a devil walking around looking for whom to desire, devour. That also does mean that the Bible talking about the prince of the power of the air is the ruler of this world. You just have to look around. I spoke about it a couple of episodes ago. Why is no one standing up? And Well, there are a couple of people. There's that beautiful golfer who did it recently. There was Sia Khaleesi um, who who run the, won the recent Rugby World Cup and had Jesus written on the inside of his arm here. But not enough people are standing up and, and giving giving grace and glory to God and to Jesus. Um, and remember that the word God is a very tricky one because uh, anything that anyone worships and gains power and insight from is their God. So someone could get up on a, on a stage and be like all glory to God and be talking about Lucifer or all glory to God and be talking about a demon or all glory to God and be talking about a deity. So that is why I always really do push the fact that if you understand God, you need to understand Son and you need to understand Holy Spirit. So what does prayer do? Prayer protects, it provides, it allows us to show honor and reverence to God, which is extremely important. It allows us to pray for abundance. It allows us to show thanksgiving. And it is really, really important. I've spoken about it before that that state entering into the presence of God, which you could do at any moment in time, even right now as I close my eyes, I can say, thank you, God. Thank you for everything you've shown me. Thank you for everything you will show me. And thank you for everyone that's reached out to me. It's it's encouraging me so deeply. Thank you. That thanksgiving, you can pray for blessing and you can pray for protection. Those are really the functions of prayer. There is nothing in my life now that I would do without praying. I've never ever, I don't even know if my husband's listening to my podcast. <laughs> it's probably going to be like, yes, I am. But he does it in his own time. I don't ask him for any kind of like feedback or whatever. But in his own life, I can see just through osmosis of what's going on with me and for, through me sharing a lot of my stories, he prays for everything now. And we need it. We need it as a couple. What we've gone through in the last short while and a marriage without the cover of God, which started with the cover of God, which lost the cover of God, is a difficult place to be. I'm not sitting here telling you all this because my life is perfect. I am telling you that my life has been a battle in the last six months more than you can ever imagine and in the years before that as well because we're all battling demons from our childhood, demonic activity in our bloodlines and evil in the world. And that sounds like some kind of a movie, take it or leave it, but that is what is happening. And if you don't have God and the cover of God and the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the scripture from the Bible programmed into your spirit, man, you will struggle. And that's the biggest change we've seen in our own lives. So even my husband, I see him. I see him praying over everything in our lives. And marriage is one of the biggest covenants. I spoke about covenants before. Marriage is designed by God. It was designed by him when he created man in his image, realized man needed a companion and a partner. So he took a rib from Adam and created Eve. The man is the head. The woman is the supporter. The church talks a lot about that and it's really misconceived in a lot of ways, but I spoke a little bit about it before. When I was living in my masculine, it makes a marriage extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and when there's no godliness in a marriage, it makes a marriage extremely difficult and it makes it very difficult for a woman to submit to man in a marriage. So the more my husband pushes forward on his work with God, the more all the pieces of our marriage fall into place. And I don't want to get into the ins and outs of marriage because everyone struggles in marriage. But I'm first to tell you that a struggle within the bounds of marriage is extremely hard. And with the cover of God is transformational. I'm not saying we're perfect, but we're definitely on the right path for the first time in a long, 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 long time. 
So I spoke a little bit before about the prayer of um, Ephesians 6, chapter 10 to 18. And this is where we talk about the cover of God. It's really, really important to be able to um, start off your prayer as I said, just using the Lord's Prayer if you want, learn it off by heart, teach it to your children and elaborate here and there when you need. But also to be able to bring your own personal circumstances into your prayer and then have scripture to lean on in that time. So I had a beautiful woman reach out to me who spoke about her daughter having night terrors and nothing they would do. You know, they, they worked on her diet. They worked on her, her mineral profile. They worked on her vitamin supplementation. They worked on her feeling safe. They worked on her bedtime stories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I suggested that she praise the, um, the armor of God over her daughter each and every single night because children are massively under attack by the devil alongside marriage. Why? Because those are the things God loves most. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, lest the person who hurts a child on earth know that once they die, if they continue that without repenting and turning to God, you know, they're better off having a millstone tied around their neck and be dropped to the bottom of the ocean than what will happen to them. So, you know, turn to God no matter what you're doing. Nothing is too ugly for him. Nothing is too evil for him. But the minute you stop breathing, it's too late. And so in this instance, the armor of God can be very protective against children and very protective against marriages, which are the two things which are very, very much under attack. Put on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, chapter, uh, verse 11. For his precepts are like the splendid armor of a heavily armed soldier. This is the um, uh, Amplified Holy Bible, which means that it takes the scripture and extends upon it so that the Aramaic translation is, is really overly kind of extended upon. So the scripture would be shorter in itself, but they really just do extend upon things. So that you may be able to successfully stand up against the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. For our struggle, and this is one of my favorite scriptures, Ephesians 6 chapter 12, is not against flesh and blood. And I remember this in child. I used to lie in bed in South Africa feeling nervous that someone would break into our house. You know, there was burglaries and crime and my grand had been robbed and we'd had our cousins had had burglars in their house. I never used to worry about praying about someone breaking into the house. Physically, I felt fear and I was anxious and felt unsafe. But I remember thinking to myself, it is the spirit which I am more afraid of. And it says in the Bible, don't worry about people that can't hurt your soul. You know, look at Jesus. He was crucified and killed, but that was just the flesh. You worry about people that can hurt your soul. And that is the spiritual realm. That is my soul was under fire and under attack every moment I was playing with these occult um, activities and moving into things that I shouldn't have been involved in. Anything that affects the sanctity and the salvation of your soul is where you need to worry. So listen to this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents. Not at all. Who cares about that? Let people hurt you. Let, you know, it says in the Bible, for we shall lo not, not love our life, not love our life until the death, which means that we overcome the devil through the word of our testimony. I spoke about this last week. And through the blood of the lamb, when I spoke about the blood of Jesus, those two things, and we shall love not our life until the death, which means that literally anything that hurts your body is of no importance. But the minute that your soul is under fire and that you are outside of the cover of the salvation of God, you need to seriously worry. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is what the Bible is telling us to worry about. And that is then counteracted with what we need to do about it. Therefore, it says in the scriptures, as a result of us knowing we're not fighting against flesh and blood, we're not worried about the man who's going to put a gun to our head and take our watch. Because a watch is a watch is a watch. We are worried about the spirit that is going to lure us down the path of meditation and spiritual enlightenment and being your own guru and your own healer and move our soul away from the point of actually being saved and having eternal life under the cover and to the glory of God, the creator of the universe. So therefore, the Bible says, put on the complete armor of God. And this is what this mother spoke to me, that the minute that the daughter partook in this prayer using this scripture she cried tears of joy and happiness for the peace that she had from that moment on so that you'll be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable and victorious. So stand firm and hold your ground. And then it will go on to tell you, you know, the, the helmet of uh, salvation, the brace, brace, 
breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the gospel of the sandal of the gospel, the words of the gospel, the word, the sword, the double edged silver sword of the word of God and the shield of faith. And you can read it all here if you want to in Ephesians, um, said it before, Ephesians chapter six, starting at verse 11. Um, and I pray, my children and I pray every night about armoring up. And that means that the double edged sword, the sharpest weapon that you hold in your hand, is the word of God and then truth, faithfulness, the gospel, understanding salvation and so on and so on and so on. So that is a beautiful prayer to add into your arsenal and to teach your children about the armor of God. How beautiful is that? There's lovely stories about it. There's lovely little videos on YouTube and you can really move through that by understanding what power that holds in our lives. The other thing I want to talk about is before when I used to pray, before I I, I, I was baptized and, and, and God really pulled me out of the pit, um, I used to do things like angel cards, astrology, angel numbers. Oh, four, 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 four. Ah, oh, the universe has got my back. No, it doesn't. You know, my back was completely and utterly free to be stabbed in a hundred times, to be hurt. My marriage was completely and utterly fair game for the devil. There was nothing that was covered or protected by me. And my children... Early two, first two children I spoke about were covenanted to God through their christening very early on, but my third not at all. And I saw the effects of that. And I don't want to go into spiritual warfare in this episode, but I just want you to understand that none of those things will give you what you need. It is the word of God sown into the spirit of yourself. And it is the realization that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but actually against principalities and powers. Principalities are groups of demons that have power over certain areas. So I want you to understand that when you go into um, any area, there's a church in that suburb, there's a church in that suburb, there's a, you know, all sorts of religious organizations have their territories. You know, this is the, 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 the this of the Johannesburg, this is the this of the UAE, this is the... It works exactly the same in the kingdom of darkness and where demons get into groups and have strongholds over certain areas. We call these principalities. I've seen them at play. You cannot mess with them. It's not even something that anyone without the right authority can pray against because you will be attacked. And this is beyond the scope of this course. But the Bible speaks specifically about strongholds, about principalities and about the way that the kingdom of darkness works. And the best resolve you have is to pray in spirit if you can, if you have the gift of tongues. Please, as much as you possibly can, all the time, it says, meditate on the word of the God, of Lord day and night. Do not live on bread alone, but literally on every word that comes out of the, um, the mouth of God. So we've talked a little bit about um, um, what, what we can pray about and how to pray. Um, how would we bring these scriptures into our lives and where, where do we begin? The most important thing you can do is using the Bible a little bit like um a, a conversation with God and my husband actually said it to me this morning he's like God's talking to me through Instagram y God can do that you know you can really learn a lot through the right people if you pray send to me information through YouTube through Instagram through social media that is going to help sow the word of God into, into my spirit the boys and I were learning the other day all the books of the Bible through a song and the colors of the rainbow and stuff like that when we had the floods here in Dubai and we did our project on Noah's Ark and so on so you can use a myriad of different resources. This book gifted to me by my friend Maria, which means so much to me, to my dearest friend Kath, may you always find your peace, love Maria. This is a book, Fighting Words, 100 Days of Speaking Truth into the Darkness. This has helped me learn um, lots of scripture and quote it and, and be able to pray through it. So the Bible offers us a lot of ways in which we learn. Start to read it at the beginning, finish at the end. The book of John is a great place to start. The book of Revelation is extremely eye-opening if you're ready. Um, the Amplified Holy Bible is the one I chose because it does elaborate on things, but the King James Version is perfect or any version you have at home. So many people have so many Bibles. When I went back to South Africa, I have about 10 Bibles. I didn't even know it. My grand gifted me one. This one I bought for myself. I got one when I graduated from school. Um, I got many as gifts from my friends over the years, all with beautiful messages in them and all with secret notes like like this note. Um, and I know my cousins um, uh, would appreciate this, the handwriting of our late grandmother, who was very dear to all of us. And I've spoken about her in my testimony. She wrote to me, I know what happened, Catherine. I know the Lord touched you. Um, be, Catherine, be strong and confident in the knowledge of his love and power. And this was a note she wrote to me after I was filled with the Holy Spirit and I spoke about it in my testimony. And this was deep inside one of those 10 Bibles. And I will never, this is more precious to me than a lot of things. But again, as God said, nothing is really of that much value except your soul. So 
start to look at the Psalms. I spoke about it before. You can open the Bible at any point in the middle and get a Psalm. Or you could get something like this book, Fighting Words, or this book, which I spoke about last week when I talked about my cousin Heather and her beautiful healing through her own faith. Faith the size of a mustard seed, God says, and you'll be able to move mountains. This was a book, which now is about 20 years old, called God's Awesome Promises. And in here, I want to tell you how you can literally just go to a page. Every, every word in this book is scripture. It's not a written book by anyone. And on page 147 of this book, you, there's millions like it, go and have a look. It tells you how the Bible is your dependable authority. The Bible is your way to succeed. The Bible is your guide for life. The Bible is your rock and the Bible is your power source. So anything that you need in life, I talk to you about this from a mending of your marriage, from a re, what's a word that was used? Someone used it for me the other day. I leaned on someone. So a really dear friend of mine, I've spoken about her before and I really leaned on her about support within the bounds of marriage restoration restoration uh, the god of restoration so um you know uh, it um also speaks about how yeah you can you can get your power source from here you can restore relationships in your life you can build your spirit up to strength you can overcome depression you can be healed i was sending a voice note to my friend elena this morning and i said to her like there is um healing in a lot of things there's the promise of healing in breath work and all the things I was talking about a little bit earlier that I experienced, even in Russian Bania, sitting in the sauna, all that. And I believe in it because I know the physical aspects of body work. The spiritual stuff I won't partake in anymore, but that's my own conviction. But nothing heals greater than the first ever physician, God, who was able to, who has his own anesthesia, who in the Bible we see miracles of him raising a young girl from the dead, raising Lazarus from the dead, healing people's blind eyes, replacing people's bones. Um, this is all stuff I believe is totally possible. And actually, um, and, and another call I had with someone the other day reached out to me. She was like, I 100% believe the full healing of my son is possible through Jesus. I just need to understand how to get that, how to grasp it, how to pray, how to know, how to feel without falling into the trap of someone selling you a snake oil, a magic ointment, even a man of God trying to sell you this water that you need to do this ritual with and all this rubbish. It's, it's, it, you can get trapped into very ritualistic ways if you listen to that kind of stuff. So the Bible will be everything to you. And um, there was a couple of scriptures I wanted to read here. In all the work you are doing, work the best you can. Work as if you are doing it for the Lord, not for people. Remember that you will receive your reward from the Lord, which he promised to his people. You are serving the Lord Christ, Colossians 3, 23 to 24. So again, there's a little bit of scripture about how the Bible will guide you in your work, how the Bible will guide you in your life. It says the orders of the Lord are right. They make people happy. And that's really a point. I'm going to stop there because the orders of whoever I was listening to before did not make me happy. I saw my life go from a bright, glowing, happy place where I was what I would call a lukewarm Christian, kind of read my Bible, had a bit of angel cards, which I chucked out. And actually the angel card lady herself had a visit from Jesus and she's thrown her whole business in the bin and you can go and look into that yourself. Hilariously speaking that she was under the guise of the spirit of divination when she brought out tarot, Christian tarot, which is not a thing. Um, but everything in my life was not made happy through listening to the things that I was hearing, traveling forward in the future, letting my soul leave my body. I became more confused. I kept, became more disconnected from my husband, more disconnected from my family and more on a on a wild goose chase so the orders of the lord are right they make you happy the commands of the lord are pure they light up the way respect for the lord is good because it will last forever the judgments of the lord are true they are completely right they are worth more than gold even the purest gold they are sweeter than honey even the finest honey and by them your servant is warned keeping them will bring great re rewards psalm 19 8 to 11 the most important thing here is that the bible is a series of warning us my people shall perish from lack of knowledge the devil roams the earth to he comes for this is a separate verse from him roaming the earth looking for what to devour it says the devil comes for three things but alone to steal kill and destroy so if you are seeing unnatural things happening in your life like untimely death or abundance of miscarriages, or things whereby it just kind of moves the needle a little bit beyond the point of coincidence, or just this is what's happening in my life, you can be sure that there are open doors, either through your ancestors or yourself, that are allowing for the devil to come and steal, kill, and destroy. And I don't really want to get into that. And I spoke a little bit last week around the blood of Jesus and the blood that the kingdom of darkness needs to kind of 
to work and to function. And um, it's, it's really, really important that we understand and we know that. So life is much more simple when you turn to the light of God, you ask for his help and you slowly ask the blood of Jesus to do the work that I spoke about last week. I spoke last week about the fact that you don't just wake up the day after you've decided that you're going to reinvigorate your life with God and then, you know, be like, woohoo, I'm healed. In actual fact, I'm going to just repeat the list from last week. Working with Jesus, asking for salvation, covering yourself, praying, pleading the blood of Jesus over your life comes with redemption, cleansing, justification, sanctification, being made more holy, life, because the life is in the blood, deeper life through the com through communion. I spoke about this last week. Intercession and access, which means being allowed to speak to God in the secret place. Anytime you close your eyes, to go and have access to the most holy place on earth, right beside God, where we speak to him and he hears our prayers. But stuff like justification, it is a process. It is a slow and beautiful process. And everyone's walk with God looks a lot different. But if you are praying with power, if you are backing up your prayer using the word, the devil does not like that. And you will see, it says in Mark 16, uh, verses 17 to 18, we have authority to pray, to drive out demons and to heal. And people are always like, oh, that is ridiculous. Who can drive out a demon? What is even a demon? These things don't exist. Stop scaring me. Um, but once you've seen it, kind of can't unsee it. Um, but it says in Mark 16, chapter seven, starting at verse 17, these signs will accompany those who have believed. So anyone who says, I believe that Jesus Christ died to save my sins and he rose on the third day. My name will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. So that is the, um, um, when I speak about speaking in tongues, praying in the spirit, they will pick up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. So this is what happened to the disciples. Jesus said, I'm not going to be on this earth for a long time. He knew he was going to die. He knew the way in which he was going to die. Um, and he said to the disciples, I want you to go and impart this power upon people. And it is given to us today for anyone who believes you have the authority to pray over your child, to pray for their healing. You have the authority to use scripture like no weapon formed against me shall prosper, or I dress myself in the armor of God, or those who should pray and pour oil on a person in the name of the Lord. That prayer said in faith will make a sick per person well. And those scriptures, by standing on them, they will speak for you. That word of God will speak for you. And the more you sow it into your spirit, the stronger you become. Remembering that this verse speaks of strong, true, pure people of God having the ability to impart these things upon others. Healing, restoration, love, joy. And that can be you. If you're walking upright with God, if you're praying, if you're building your relationship with God, and you're strong in your sense of how much you want to learn about him, your prayer will be as valuable as the next person and you never have to go and find someone to heal you, find someone to make you better. You go straight to your creator and you ask him for the things standing on his promises in the Bible. Another quick, easy hack is simply that you would be like, what does pray, what does prayer say about, um, you know, um, addiction? What does prayer say about gambling? What does prayer say about drunkenness? What does prayer say about X, Y, and Z. What does prayer say about children? What does prayer say about? Because God says that as parents, we have an absolute duty to bring our children up in the way of God, listening to the word of God, sowing that into their spirit. And he promises us there's a covenant between us and God. If our child is dedicated to God and we do what we are told to do in the Bible as parents, that child will never stray from God. They might have a little blip in the ocean like I did or a huge big blip in the ocean like some children do. But God has his hand over you. And that is what I spoke about in my testimony before. He will never let you go. But we do. We have that free will. So you can switch off this episode and be like, this chick is nuts. Um, or... You can close your eyes and say to God, I'm knocking and I and I'm and, and based on the scripture I said before, Jeremiah 33, 3, God, I'm praying Jeremiah 33, 3 to you today. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great things you have not known. And you might back that up with, I heard in the Bible it said that my people perish from lack of knowledge. I don't want to be one that perishes. Give me the knowledge that I need to walk in in the way that you would like me to walk so that my children and my children's children may be well. Because again, in the Bible, it says that if there's been idolatry or if anyone in our bloodline three to four generations back has been deceived by the devil and gone and 
entered into religions that might be described as a worship of God but are not or might have certain elements of them where they have their own version of the Bible or their own this, that, or the next thing, pray over these things and start to understand, is this what I'm, is what I'm being told true? Because if there's deception in the bloodline, God says that that curse will follow for two to three, through to the third and fourth generation, which means that if you're believing that, you know, whatever it is that you might be believing and it doesn't fit with the word of God, that will curse the third and fourth generation uh, beyond you which means that four generations to come will struggle um, and I'm not saying you need to change I was talking to my amazing friend um, Lex on a voice note this morning and I sh and she was reaching out to me and I said I never want this I never want what I'm saying to feel like it's like if you don't do this you must do this no not at all all it is is that you reach out in your life you pray um, to the one true living God and you say, show me, show me in my life how I can move, how I can change, how there can be certain a way forward um, and, and show me the way. Your word is like a lamp to my feet. So let your word be the lamp to my feet. Start to read the Bible. You can read the children's version of the Bible. I told you I brought back from South Africa um, <clears throat> a children's version of the Bible. I've loved every minute of it because we're quite far into, um, we're reading the King James version or we're reading the New International Version, whatever. Um, we're not reading this amplified version, which is amplified, so there's much more writing in it. And the boys and I are nearly at the end, so now we're starting again with creation, understanding all the things that are said. And there's so many parables and so many lessons in here that it seems like you'll never get to understand the Bible, but the more that you read it and the more people talk about it and the more you listen to podcasts and the more you want to, you're hungry for the Word of God, the more it all starts to make sense and it really is actually quite simple. My last kind of few things I want to touch on um, is when you are in a time of, of, of attack, when you feel like someone in the family is ill or you're seeing things happening in the family that just seem like they might have a spiritual um, root, then you need to enter into what's called spiritual warfare. That's a bit more stronger prayer. Again, um, I had to learn to pray that way. I spoke about it when my child got really sick. I knew he wasn't dedicated to God. I knew I turned my back from things that I was doing and was facing towards God. And there's a lot of resistance because remember I said before, so the devil, and it speaks about in the Bible, is roaming the earth, coming to steal, kill, destroy, looking for what to devour. He is not concerned with anyone that is not seeking the truth. So if you're kind of quite happily just saying every now and then grace or God is good or whatever, but you don't really actually think any of this amounts to anything. Um, the devil's quite comfortable with you. You know, it's fine. It's He's happy with that. And um, anyone that's kind of lost, or like uh, away from God, he knows his biggest advantage is the free will that God gives us. Um, and there's a brilliant book I'm reading called The Screw Tape Letters. Actually, Stephen, my cousin, I've talked about a few times before, he introduced it to me by C.S. Lewis, written like a long, long, long time ago. And it's about two demons, a, a, a kind of um, principal demon called Screw Tape and his apprentice demon, who's his nephew, called Wormwood. And he writes letters to Wormwood, encouraging him how to help man. Uh, defile his character and move away from God. It's a fascinating book. He said he doesn't really let, let, let you know where the kind of, um, um, where the, uh, just read it if you're interested, The Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. But in that, it gives you a lot of examples of how hard demons are working to pull us off track and to keep us away from the Word of God. So the minute that you turn to the truth and you play on that scripture of, um, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That is a scripture in the Bible. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So maybe that is your prayer. God, I shall know the truth. The truth shall set me free. Show me the truth. Small by small by small by small. Meet me where I'm at. Walk me on my own path in the way that is going to feel okay to me. Um, and when you start to know the truth and you start to become free as a result, the devil ain't going to like it. And that's when you'll start to experience potentially needing to pray spiritual warfare. And please feel free to reach out to me as to how I learned that myself or ask God to teach you how to pray more powerfully in the spirit in order to stop or hinder the attacks. Because remember what I said, if Judgment Day is written in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, which is a prophecy, if it is written and we know exactly what's going to happen and the devil ends up in the lake of fire and you can read all about hell, it's not a place you want to go, trust me. Um, uh, you can also then understand, well, if the devil's already lost, then, you know, why should I be afraid of him? Because he wants to take as many people as he can with him and not let them understand the truth of God and walk in eternal life. Because the life that we have on earth, if we live to 120 years, um, which God actually shortened the lifespan after the flood, after he flooded the earth, he said to Noah, 
the, the earth is so evil. It's filled with so much inequity. And I wouldn't be, uh, uh, I w literally wouldn't be surprised if we weren't far off where we were just before God flooded the earth. He was like, there is so much evil in this earth. There's evil on TV. There's evil in the news. There's evil in the hearts of man. They, man can't trust their own heart. There's so much evil. There's child abuse. There's pedophilia. There's sexual abuse. There's trafficking. There's all this stuff going on. And it's very much uh, available for people to see. And you just don't have to dig very deep. Um, so I'm going to just flood the earth and Noah, you are an upright man and you and your wife and your three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth and their wives will get on the ark with two of every animal and we'll start again. But at the end of that, the, a rainbow came out after 40 days and 40 nights, everything on the earth was obliterated. And there is, a, um, I don't really want to get into it now, uh, to talk about the kingdom of the waters and what happened there, but park that for now. That rainbow, every time we see a rainbow, we know that is a promise from God that he will never flood the earth again. Noah said to him, you, this is, it's one way to start again, but we don't want to ever do that again. And God is like, no matter the iniquity, no matter the sin, no matter the level of evil, that the ruler of the world, the prince of the power of the air, Satan, is able to bring about, I will never, ever, ever obliterate the earth again. It'll happen differently next time. So that's where we talk about God um, coming down to earth again. But spiritual warfare, um, using the word of God is a really strong way to pray. So you might also just pray of like, um, uh, um, the devil came to steal, kill and destroy, open my eyes and see where these things are happening in my life, where things are being stolen from me because the devil doesn't like you to fulfill your destiny. He doesn't like you to be working to the glory of God. He doesn't like you to have a marriage that is solid and that is rock, 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 rock solid. So he puts things in our paths that cause us to think that divorce is probably just a way better than bothering to fight for this marriage. It's very hard to fight for things without the cover of God. So understand that. Um, uh, demons are at play all the time. Read the screw tape letters, see what you have to think about that book. You can get um, simple little leaflets and things. This was after my grandmother on my father's side, Dorothy, passed. This Bible, this little leaflet thing was in a group of photographs um, and things. And my dad said I could look through it and take it. And this is how to use the Bible. When in sorrow, when men fail you, when you've sinned, when you worry. Worry is worship to the devil. That's exactly what the Bible says. Worry is a form of worship to the devil. Do not spend any time worrying. Do not worry is like 2,000 times in the Bible. Do not fear. When you are in danger, when you are depressed, when God seems really far away, when doubts come upon you, when you're lonely, there's a big one because trust me, when you do turn and go back into your faith, it can see, seem extremely lonely. And that's why I keep thanking everyone who's reached out to encourage me. I've really needed it. When you feel down and out, when you want rest and peace, when you want Christian assurance, when you leave home, when you grow bitter or cynical, when you have a spirit of disbelief, how's that? When you actually, there is such a thing as a spirit of disbelief that works in people to make them literally believe that this is the biggest load of rubbish ever and it's just a silly little story and we're going to just end up in a grave and that's the end of us, you know? For Jesus' idea of a Christian, Jesus' idea of religion, really good one, because religion for me is a very big red flag. How to pray, how to worship. Um, there's scriptures for all of that and you can just really, you can really, really look into that. So I think I've covered absolutely everything I want to cover today. I'm going to finish with one more scripture, which is Proverbs uh, chapter four. But before I do that, I'm just going to run through um, what's coming up. <clears throat> Next week, I'm going to be chatting through the Holy Spirit. And um, it was a friend of mine uh, who was in a um, religion in, in South America uh, before, which was a lot to do with spirits and not the good kind. Um, spiritism is actually a religion. Um, and she really struggled with the idea of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people do. What do you mean there's a spirit that fills your body and it guides you? I spoke to you about it before when Jesus was um, about to be crucified at the Last Supper. He spoke to the disciples and when he was risen again, he said, I will, I leave you. I, I ascend and I go to the right hand of my father until I come again in glory. We wait for him to come back down where he will dwell again with us and there will be the new uh, um uh, however he wants it to be no one knows the time not even the angels in heaven not anyone except God the father um, but he says I leave with you my spirit so that you will never be alone so that you have discernment and so that you have the ability to pray in tongues and that you have the ability to cast out demons and the ability to have uh, cover over your lives and your family as you walk on the earth where the devil is the king of the earth, the prince of the power of the air. And so the Holy Spirit, understanding of it, not being afraid of it, um, understanding the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings and allowing yourself to be filled with that Holy Spirit is extremely, extremely interesting and important. So please join me for that. Episode 11, I will be talking a little bit about deliverance. 
it's quite an interesting one because there are quite a few people who believe that if you are filled with the Holy Spirit that you cannot have any demonic activity in your life. Um, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in, 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 in a very elaborate way and still had difficulty. So I would disagree with that based on my own experience. And I just want to explain to you um, deliverance. The word is quite strong and can put a lot of people off, but I'm just going to pray and pray and pray. Um, over the next two weeks as to how God would like me to deliver the message of my deliverance and how that would come across. And then we're going to talk a little bit about angels and demons. There's a lot about how they were created, what they are, uh, how demons came about, fallen angels, what happened there. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about biblical fasting in episode 13. And then I want to talk about covenants, the covenants um, on which we can stand in our lives and how simple things like shaking hands with people, exchanging money I spoke about can enter you into an agreement or a covenant and it can be extremely dangerous. So if you are unaware of where someone that is telling you your future or where someone that is giving you a miraculous crystal thing on your knee and then your knees healed, you know, that power's got to come from somewhere. Um, and if you pay them money and, 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 and in exchange for their service, you enter into an agreement with that person and that's an open door and that's where we can really um, uh, bring things into our lives that we don't want. So I want to just explain that a little bit. And then as always, I've had so many wonderful people reach out to me who are willing and able to share their testimonies. And if you wanted to, please reach out to me. Um, I know a lot of you are nervous and scared and it is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. But um, um, if you feel called, then, you know, please, please do do reach out to me. Remember that at the most basic level of, of prayer, we have the Lord's Prayer, which is so beautiful, something you can learn really easily. You can share with your children. And it is the first way in which the disciples said to Jesus, how on earth are we actually supposed to pray? And he said, it goes a little bit like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Bring back your kingdom to this world where there's so much darkness and evil. Let your will be done. Not my will, not what I want for my life, but what I know that you have planned for my life, which is far more glorious and beautiful than I could ever imagine. And Jesus says, does not come without suffering. Because actually we spoke about this in church two weeks ago when I was seriously suffering and in a huge amount of pain. Um, I've spoken about what I've been going through and I don't need to go into detail, but actually it said suffering is where our faith gets purified. Suffering is part of God's plan. And I wrote that down and I thought, thank you, God. That message was just perfect for me. Suffering is where our faith gets purified and suffering is part of God's plan. So just remember that, you know, prayer is is paramount. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. It's really important to honor what God is and does and is capable of doing for us. Um, God himself can deliver you. God himself can break you through from chains. It is very possible to see and meet and know Jesus. I've had that experience um, and it doesn't have to look like that for you. So your prayer would always be meet me where I am at. Um, and let's close finally with Proverbs, which there was a funny thing the other day, like Proverbs Psalms are all the kind of glory and adoration to God and lovely like this, that, and the next thing I spoke to you about it. You can open your Bible up at any point on a psalm. We'll do it again today like we always do. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I have unwavering trust and I rely on you with steadfast confidence. Do not let me be ashamed or my hope in you be disappointed. Do not let my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, none of those who expectantly wait for you will be ashamed. Those who turn away from what is right and deal treacherously without cause, those are the ones who will be ashamed. So there's just a lovely little psalm. And then the Proverbs, which is the book after Psalms, is kind of like the, if you do this, that's what's going to happen. Mm, I wouldn't do that because that's what might happen. It's quite hilarious in the Proverbs. It's kind of like, don't do the things in the Proverbs and you'll be fine. And remember, again, the beautiful part of praying on my people par perish from lack of knowledge. Please, God, I don't want to perish just because I don't know. You know how many times you look at someone, you're like, oh, shame, that person doesn't know that if they just turned around, there's a toilet there that doesn't have a queue. Or, oh, that person's doing all that energy. Didn't they know that you just push that button and the thing lifts up on its own? It's that kind of thing. So Proverbs um, chapter 4, 20 to 22, it says, my son, God speaking directly to us, pay attention to my words and be willing to learn. Open your ears to my sayings. Do not let them escape from your sight. Keep them in the center of your heart, for they are life to those who find them. 
my words are life to those who find them. That's exactly how I feel. I, 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 I got life through these words. You can fast, you cannot eat for a week and feel not hungry through sati satiation through these words and through the life that the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for us brings. For they are life to those who find them and they are healing and health to all their flesh. Watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flows the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful, lying, misleading mouth and put devious lips far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead towards the path of moral courage and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you towards the path of integrity. Consider well and watch carefully the path of your feet and all your ways will be steadfast and sure. I don't know anything outside of the promises of God that can give you that promise to stand upon. And with that said, I'm just going to close in prayer. Father God, thank you for this time spent together. Thank you for leading us and guiding us. May all the words spoken fall upon those listening and, and give them ears to hear. I pray, Father God, let your Holy Spirit fill this podcast, Father God, fill me and fill every word that I speak, that anyone listening is able to experience the power of your Holy Spirit, be filled and be guided and hungry for more and more and more of your word, Father God. And even if the spark is a tiny little one, that something inside of someone gives them the power to pray. If there's a situation in anyone listening's life, that prayer would be the absolute solution. Speak to them now, Father God, I pray, and let them open themselves up in prayer. And some ways that can look like simply just falling to your knees or literally just letting your eyelids drop and be able to cry out to God, he says, give it to me, hand it all over to the Lord. Do not worry. Give it to me. I will make you whole. I will heal you. Um, and really one of the most beautiful, beautiful scriptures, which we'll close this prayer with, which is something that I wanted to share. And it just kind of was prompted by God to read it now. I should know it off by heart, but I'm still learning. Psalm 143 verse 8. Show me the way, Father God. Show me the way I should go. For in you I entrust my life. And there is no greater trust and no greater relationship and no greater promise keeper, no greater way maker than the Lord our God. In Jesus' name we say thank you and amen. Amen.